directing is about storytelling. In the end, that's what it is. Um, and the skill of it, I think, is to have a clear sense of why you've engaged with the material that you've engaged with. What is it you're trying to say through it? What's the purpose of the piece? And that's your sort of strategic goal. And somewhere you've got to pull together all the elements that comprise storytelling, whether it's story, screenplay, resources, performance, design, camera, sound, you know, construction, editing, post-production design, until finally you you yield the film, the movie, the, the piece of cinematic storytelling, which is a different thing to a novelized story or, or a, you know, poetic or prose story. It's not the same as words on a page. It's cinematic storytelling, which can be narratively driven or it can be driven by images and mood. In the end, it's a story. You know, it's, it's films, obviously, commercial films tend to be much more weighted towards narrative storytelling because it's very accessible. It's got a clear line and it drives and, you know, tends to attract a broader audience. But storytelling that's much more episodic or, or um, you know, image-based or mood-based is still storytelling, and that's the art and the magic of cinema. You have to, to develop and place all those elements marshaled to just that form to deliver the meaning that you want. And everything that you do and everything that everybody else does is all but process to create the moment when the actor can perform. Because without that, there is nothing. And that sort of, you have to, I think, grasp that at its inception, you know. Uh, now, then there are lots and lots of different ways, of course, that directors will try to harness that magical power that actors have. And there are lots and lots of different ways. I mean, you know, ranging from very formal ones to very informal ones. That's just taste and what works for the piece. And, you know, um, yeah. Great, great films have been made by performances that have very, very few words. And great, great performances have been made which are chock full of them. You know, there's no rules to that save that it's all about the performance. It's the big factors that very often in films dictate the choices that you later make, the, you know, the big context in which you're operating. And that's true whether it's a small film or in this case quite a large film. The context we were operating in this film was that it was the, it was the third of a successful called franchise franchise movie and what had brought me to the Bourne franchise in the first place was that it didn't feel like a big Hollywood franchise at all it felt actually like an indie film that's what I liked about it. that's what brought me to it and I think that's probably why they wanted me to make them but in a way by the time we all came back to make the third one, it was a bit difficult for us to pretend that this was anything other than a very big, successful, well-resourced Hollywood movie. Now, the difference between the bigger movies and the smaller movies is just money. And what money buys you is the ability to control your environment. So, traditionally, a big movie will set up camp, establish a perimeter, 
within which the scene is set. Generally, the sets are quite big. It's all very, very controllable. And you can create scenes that are shot at scale, appropriate for big commercial films. Well, you don't have those resources in independent film. So as an independent film, you tend to live off the land and they're much more guerrilla in style. And that's what had made the Bourne franchise work. It, it, it was true to those indie roots. So the problem I had to begin with in this film is how can we stay true to those roots but still shoot clearly what would be required, which was a big commercial film. And that led me to make the decisions that I did at the outset, which is that all the action in that movie was going to be set in what I tried to develop, which were very long set pieces, set in highly, highly public and utterly uncontrollable spaces. They're essentially populated environments where life is continuing and life is the master of the film, not the other way around. And it forced us to behave like we'd started out as, as, as an indie film, but on grand scale. To the point where at Waterloo, we actually couldn't set up camp at Waterloo. We were only allowed to bring in a very small number of people. We were only allowed to shoot in very limited periods of time and we weren't allowed to impede in any way, shape or form the ongoing activity of the station. And it was actually the same at the market, and the same in, in New York, but to a somewhat lesser extent. And in a way, it dictated everything about that sequence, followed from that choice, to the point where, at Waterloo, our base was some miles away from Waterloo, where our camp and equipment and all that was, and we would come in very few of us to the station and shoot 10 o'clock in the morning till I think 4 or 4.30 in the afternoon. And that was absolutely integral to the composition of the scene because it meant that we could construct this elaborate chase but it was all going to go on in and amongst real life. And I think that was imperative to making it feel fresh before you kind of began. The second thing about it was that, that, you know, one of the interesting things about the Bourne franchise is it kind of gives you an opportunity to tell some truths about, you know, about power and, and malign government and, you know, Bourne is this sort of individual, he's rather a sort of counterculture individual who's kind of on our side against the bad them who control our destiny you know generally are inside the government and and I love the idea of the surveillance society trying to sort of put a finger on that and make Bourne essentially play a game of cat and mouse with the surveillance society because somewhere in all of our lives we're dimly aware of the fact that you know there are cameras watching everywhere you know ID checks the whole kind of panoply of state power that somewhere we're tiny ants wandering around in our lives with this vast apparatus above us. So I love the idea of having Bourne play a physical game of cat and mouse. So that was the sort of second element. Then we had our narrative element which is Bourne colliding with this journalist who stumbled on the truth about you know Operation Treadstone. And that gave us the sequence, really, because then it became born arranging this meeting, born knowing that this would bring whoever was following the journalist to the meeting, and then born would have to play cat and mouse to get out the other side. And that way you could play the moves and counter moves, born realising that the bad guys are there, born trying to save the journalist, the journalist being, in a sense, in our shoes, the innocent party unaware of you know the magnitude of what was going on around him and that kind of I think gave the audience a really kind of great ringside view of Bourne and his skill set you know and also the unfolding sense of danger 
and that meant that you could layer in you know watch what you want in any good action sequence you need to step up a level you know get the threat coming and then that leading to a move on the other side and then another threat level and another move and you know you're building and building and building to a fixed point of generally violence and then off you go and it sort of worked I think <laughs>